Good morning, everyone. Please stand. You're welcome. You guys are faithful. Praise the Lord. So I want to read to you a verse that's just really been helping me during the season that I've been in. And it's Isaiah 41, verse 10. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isn't that good? I just love these promises. So it's like whenever I'm like, I, I can't do this. God's, God's bringing this verse back to me, you know, and I'm like, well, well th this, this hurts, you know, this is hard. He's bringing this verse back to me, you know, I, I just, I'm too tired, you know, he's bringing this verse back to me. It's like, you know, life is hard and, and we're humans and, you know, we just, we have this source of strength, you know, we don't have to strive. We don't have to try so hard, you know, he's always with us and he's helping us. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm right there with you. So, say with me, I will fear not, for God is with me. I will not be dismayed, for he is my God. He is strengthening me. He is helping me. He is holding me up with his righteous right hand. Man, can you give him thanks for that today? Hallelujah. All right, well, we're going to We're going to sing some songs. We have a part angel band today. <laughs> so, let's just begin to lift him up today. Thank you, Lord. We glorify you in this place, Lord God. You're worthy. We lift you up, Lord. It's so amazing, God. Thank you, God, for who you are and for what you've done, for what you're doing, Lord. Because there is no one like you, God. Shakes the whole earth with hope. 
There truly is no one like you, Lord. Thank you, God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Yes. We serve an impossible, impossible, not an impossible God. We serve a God of the impossible. Amen. Yes, and we just got to trust him because he's got this. Whatever it is, we're just leaning back into his arms. Oh, yes, because he is mighty. Yes. Oh, Lord, we lift you up today. We exalt you, God. Lift 
everything, okay? He's done the hard work. He's the one who did it. He wants to take those burdens right off your shoulders, and he just gives you his peace instead. Doesn't that sound like a better deal? Thank you, God. Yes, we thank you, Lord, for your peace. Thank you, God, for your grace. And thank you, God, for your love. Yes, Lord, we receive it. Yes, just receive it right now. Even if all you do is just say, I receive it. You know, sometimes you just say it, and that's kind of like an active doing, you know. We just receive it right now, God. And thank you for that, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Shadow you on light up, mountain you on climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, fire you won't tear me down, coming after me.
Jesus. God, you're worthy. We give you all praise. We give you all glory. We give you all honor, Lord. You are God. You are great. There is none like you, Father. We just thank you for who you are. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for your presence reigning in our lives today. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Well, we're glad you're here this morning joining us in person and online. Um, I would ask that those that are here, if you could sit down, that would be great. We are glad to have you here this morning with us. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. It is June. I can't believe it. It's already here. Wow, it's crazy, huh? But this morning, uh, we have a couple of announcements. We have, uh, of obviously, if you have any prayer requests or praise reports, please send them in at prayer at churchpluggedin.com so we can pray for you. We want to do that for you. Every week we get together and pray. So that is um, a very important thing. So if you have any, please send them in. We have um, also Hildebarge. If you're interested in helping, please reach out to me. We have an opportunity on June 14th to serve a meal. So there are still components of that meal that may be needed. So reach out to me via email, carrieann.hall at churchpluggedin.com, and we will um, get you hooked up so you can help support that ministry as well. And then also on July 11th, we will be back at Garfield on Sunday mornings going forward. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So just mark your calendars. That'll be a day of celebration. I cannot wait till we get back to our regular scheduled se- you know, Sundays. Amen? Amen. So um, at this time, though, it is June, and um, all of our kids are wrapping up their school year. And this is always a special time for me. I love to honor our high school graduates. I mean, college graduates are great. Preschool graduates are great. Moving up to the next school is great, but there's something about the high school graduates. So this this year in this church, we have three graduates. There are three young men. We have um, Christopher Kamira, CJ, Christopher Hall, we're in, and David Williams. So I want you to turn and face everybody for just a minute. Show your lovely faces. Hallelujah. Are you glad it's done? <laughs> All right, so CJ is graduating from Woodbridge Senior High School. Christopher is graduating from Hall Academy. He's homeschooled. That's actually our official name on our transcripts. And then David Williams is graduating from Stafford High School. So congratulations, all of you guys. So now if I can ask the graduates to turn and face this way. All right. All right. So, I want to tell you guys a little something just for a moment before we pray. Uh, Dad, you're going to come pray. Brother Landy, I w- I'd like for you too, if you, if you could come forward as well. Everybody out here, you remember how it was when you graduated. If you remember, raise your hand. I know you remember those that have graduated. And there were life choices for you, and there was all these paths that you could take, Right? There was all these things. You got a pass laid out. And some of you, you got, you got plans. I know you got plans. I talked to you. You college. You know, I know, you, I know you're accepted at college, you know, and, and, and you're getting a job. And, and we're, we're doing these things, you know, right? And it's all for our careers. We're, we're working towards our careers. We're working towards what we're going to do in our life. The scripture, though, talks about two men that built their lives. The wise man, he built his life on the rock. The foolish man, he built his house on the sand. And the house represents your life. And the, the wise man, he built it on Jesus. The foolish man built it on his own self. That's the interpretation of that right there with the house. It, it was his own thing. Oh, I like this spot. This sandy spot, this looks great. This looks good. You've got all kinds of choices ahead of you. And what I want to say to you is be led by the Spirit. I cannot tell you anything else better than that. Over the years, and I'm not that old, I'm in my 40s, but over the years, many people have come to me in their their young 20s, and they're talking about, I wish I had done this, I had done that. And they were trying to fix mistakes that they made then. How many out here can identify? Come on. And it's everybody. But you know what? 
And, you know, we say that, yeah, you can, you're, you're going to make mistakes, whatever, but, but do you really have to? Not on the big, especially on the big stuff. You don't have to make mistakes. The philosophy that says you're just supposed to go out there and go figure things out, that's baloney. The scripture never once says just go out there and figure it out and just do, oh, you're going to go to class, you're going you're gonna to figure it all, you know, you'll know what you're going to do. No, it's not you know, it's what is the spirit saying to you? What is burning in your chest? And if you follow that burning in your chest, you follow the spirit, you will be like the wise man who built his house. In other words, he built his life on the rock, which gave him a foundation. And when the storms come, and see, the rest of that story is when the storms came, the man on the rock, his house was standing strong. The one when the sand uh, built on the sand, when the storms came, it was flattened. It was flattened. So you have a choice before you, and here it is. You can choose to be wise, or you can choose to be a fool. And a fool, the scripture says, is right in his own eyes. So don't be right in your own eyes. Be right with what the Spirit is saying within you. I, I, that's the best word I could give for you. And look, I wasn't going to say anything this morning at this time. I said, baby, oh, this is you, and then get dad to come and pray for them. All of that. And I mean, it was song one. And the Lord said to say this to you. And so when the Lord speaks, that means you needed to hear it. And when the Spirit revealed that to me, He's saying, You need to hear this. You need to heed this. And I know your parents want this for you as well. I know I want this for you, my son. And your parents, I know, want this for you, and your parents want this for you. To be wise in your life built on the rock. Yes, so I'm going to hand this mic to Dad, and he's going to pray for you. And Brother Landy's going to come and lay hand. These are men of faith, men that believe. And we're going to agree as a church mm -hmm. for you in your life moving forward that you would always be led by the Spirit in your life it, your house will be built on that rock, and when those storms come, you'll know exactly what you need to do to stand. Church, let's all stand. Let's raise your hands this way. If you're listening at home, yes, we prayed this already, but you can pray for these here. Dad, come forward, please. The Lord says, if you acknowledge me, I will direct your path. Amen. He also says he'll give you the desires of your heart. And that promise comes with acknowledge him first, and he will give you the desires of your heart. He will put that in you. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, we pray for these young men. Lord, we thank you for their lives. We thank you for what you have spoken to them today. We thank you for that anointing to rest upon them, your guidance, your direction, in Jesus' name. Father, I pray a hedge of protection over them. Lord, for the days ahead... The voices of the world will not penetrate, but only your voice will rule and reign in their heart, in their mind, in their emotions. And Lord, they're acknowledging you right now. And Lord, we thank you for directing their path in every aspect of their path. Father, we thank you for giving wisdom to see and understand and see every pit of the enemy or every snare the enemy would set before them. Father, we thank you that exposed and rebuked in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the release of that anointing in your presence and blessings upon them now. In Jesus' holy name. Amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. I do remember graduation day. Hallelujah. Just a couple of days ago. How about that? Uh, it's time to give. So let me tell you the ways uh, which you can give. You can go to our website at churchpluggedin.com and click on the Give Now tab. You can also text your tithes and offerings to 703-997-4640 
or you can mail them in to the Connection Church, P.O. Box 7658, Woodbridge, Virginia, 22195. Two very familiar passages of Scripture this morning. The first is John 3.16, and we all know that passage. For it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. So it was God who started the system of sowing and reaping. He sowed his son to reap you and me. Amen. And Matthew 24 and 14, and it reads, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So let's recognize as the body of Christ, Jesus is depending on you and he's depending on me in supporting his gospel, getting this good news preached throughout the globe. Amen? Amen. So as God gave us his best, which was Jesus, let us today give him our best in support of his gospel. So with your tithes and offerings in your hand, let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for reminding us that nothing happens in the earth without someone first sowing a seed. And you started the system. You sowed Jesus, which was your very best. So this morning, we come and we sow the very best of what you've given us. We sow the tithes. We sow the offerings. And we say that we are joyous. We're cheerful in supporting your gospel, that others may hear the good news. We thank you for it and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And we want to thank you for your faithful support here at The Connection. And those who are here, you can give your tithes and offerings as you exit on today. Amen. So church, are you ready for the word? Excellent, excellent. You know, we've been going over this series, uh, the parables of Jesus, and this has really touched me because I've never done a series like this, and it's a little different. And when you're looking at these different parables, they all have so, uh, so many different things in them that are just so good. And we only have so much time to point out all of the things in these parables. And today, I don't want to keep you too, too long, but I want us to make sure that we get uh, what we need out of this parable today, because I believe it can be life-changing. It can do something in you, it can do something in me, and change us to further the kingdom of God. Church, we are on this earth to live in and advance the kingdom of God. Our first thing is to live in the kingdom and to make sure we're doing what Jesus said for us to do. That first and greatest and commandment and the second one. And then we are to uh, advance the kingdom by sharing it with all of those around us. Now, we've been looking and gleaning from a book on the parables of Jesus by Robert Kappen. But in today's parable, we're going to move away from Robert Kappen's interpretation. Now, see... And you say, well, oh, what, what, why, why, was he way off? Well, I, you know what, I don't know if he was exactly right on that, but I just see it a little different. So we're going to go with how the Spirit, and I, you know, and I research and I double-check people. I look at so many different ones, and, and I can say this, that he very well could be right with his interpretation of how this uh, parable should be looked at. But And he also acknowledges the way that I'm going to uh, present it to you today. So sometimes with some of the parables, there's more than one way to look at them. A a amen. And we can look at them and we can get uh, from the Spirit as the Spirit leads uh, what the, the parable's trying to say. Now, there's a caveat to that. I want to give you a caveat. Yes, you could interpret it a couple of different ways, but those, both of those interpretations need to line up with the rest of the Word. Okay? Now, and his does. His lines up with the word. And what I'm going to present to you today lines up with the word. And so 
we need to make sure that our interpretations, when we are interpreting the parables of Jesus, that they line up with the Word of God. That is the single most important thing for us. Now, Robert Kappen does divide these parables into three groups, the parables of the kingdom, parables of grace, and parables of judgment. And we're looking at the parables of grace right now, and we looked at a lot of the parables of the kingdom. And you know what? We're not going to get all of the parables. This is just to get some of the main ones that we want to look at and as the Spirit leads to look at. Like last week, we looked at the parable of the unforgiving servant. And this week, I want to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this parable falls in the parable, uh, parables of grace. And so before we continue, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you that our hearts and our minds are open, ready to receive what you have for us here today. Lord, all of our hope, all of our trust, all of our faith is in you. And Lord, we thank you for continuing to transform us into your likeness. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. So in the parables of grace so far, Jesus has really been preoccupied with the notion that the work of the Messiah will be accomplished not by winning, but by losing. Now, what do I mean by that? He emphasizes some categories, and we'll look at this here on the screen. The category, the catalog of losing, uh, if you will, the last, the least, the lost, the little, and the dead. I mean, we have these different ones that Jesus emphasizes. And we see these, uh, and we look at them, and we say, uh, this doesn't make sense. I'm supposed to be the least, but he said the last. I'm supposed to be last, and Jesus said the last will be first. You know, all of these things that Jesus emphasized. And now in these grace parables moving forward, the ones that we'll do this week and in the next couple of weeks, Jesus seems more than term, determined than ever to push this insistence on losing as winning. All right? And on weakness as strength. All the way to his own death, okay, which was losing, but it actually turned out because of the resurrection to be winning to be victory. And yes, it was humility or humiliating. It was uh, Jesus, you know, crucifying himself really so he could go and, and his own actual body be crucified, giving up his own will. It wasn't easy. He even said to the Father, you know, if, if you can take this from me, let this cut pass from me. And he said, though not my will, but your will. And that right there is key. Not my will, but your will. Very similar as we were talking with the graduates here about the man who built his life on the sand. That was his will. That wasn't the wisdom of God. That wasn't the leading of the Spirit. And in the parable of the Good Samaritan, we see this, this pattern that it's not about me. It's about the spirit that's within me. And that is the emphasis. Now, the parable of the Good Samaritan is Jesus' answer to a question posed by a lawyer. Let's look at it. In Luke 10, verse 25, it says, And behold, a lawyer, a certain lawyer, stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it. Now, why does Jesus answer a question with a question? And really, I, you know, I looked at this and I started thinking about it because, I, you know, I hate that when someone does that to me uh, most of the time. But I have to admit, I do it to other people too. And sometimes it's because I'm challenging, okay, the other person. And I believe that Jesus is sensing a certain hostility in the lawyer's motives. And notice, because it says, he tested him. Tested him. Jesus doesn't need to be tested. Who are you, fool? Come up here and test Jesus, right? You know, he doesn't need that. So there was something there 
that made Jesus say, you know what, I'm not just going to answer this right now. I'm going to ask him this question here, you know. And keep in mind, I believe that, you know, and, and, and here's the thing. We have to recognize the lawyer as an establishment type individual. We have to recognize him as one who's, he's an expert because, you know, when you go and you study this out, the lawyer, he's an expert in Jewish, Mosaic, and rabbinical law. I mean, in other words, he knows the law in and out. He already knows the answer to the question that's being asked. He knows. That's why he's testing Jesus. He's an expert. But he has no real need to ask Jesus this question because of that. But at this point, Jesus, he's long been aware of all of these establishment type individuals, these priests and these different ones that are against him. He already knows that these people don't like him. These religious elite. Uh, he already knows that. He's received a lot of pushback from them already. And so here's another lawyer, another, quote, expert, and he's coming and he's asking this question to Jesus. So Jesus responds with caution and asks him a question. So why does the lawyer ask? What does he think he can learn? I, who knows? Maybe, though, just maybe, he's heard some of these parables before. He's been hearing some of what Jesus talked. Maybe he's been around a little bit. We don't know for sure. And if, but if that is the case, and he's been around, and he's been hearing, he's been hearing all this stuff about losing as winning. Last and least, the least of these. He's heard all these phrases that Jesus has been saying. So maybe... He's wanting to test him with this and see what he says. Like, hey, look, what kind of losing uh, as winning thing are you going to be able to pull up now with this question? Ha, I got gotcha. you. So that's what this lawyer is doing. But see, when we see this word eternal, a lot of times we misinterpret this word. In the Greek, it means without beginning and end, that which always has been and always will be, never to cease. One of the most misunderstood words, because it doesn't refer to a life that begins after we die. That's not what this is referring to. Eternal life is a particular quality of life. A life that can only come from God and a life that we can have right now and a life that will continue without ceasing that's what the word eternal means that right there it's now your eternal life has already begun you've given your life over to Christ it, your eternal life has begun you can live that quality of life in the now amen so let, let, let's make sure we get this right so, in verse 27, so the lawyer, after Jesus gave him a question back, gave him a question in response to his question, here's what the lawyer said. He answers it. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But here's the lawyer, but he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So here's another certain kind of almost his hostility with the lawyer again, challenging, poking. Oh, I want to see what you're going to say, Jesus, to this one. You know, so that's what he's kind of doing here. But Jesus, now he doesn't ask a question in response to his question. This time, he ends up going right into the parable. And, you know, when we see this wanting to justify himself, look, regardless of the lawyer's intentions, it seems that Jesus, he kind of drops his guard, so to speak. After this question, he goes right into the parable. He tells the parable as if he's answering the question to a mind that's honestly curious about the mystery of lostness, of losing as winning. Now, there's no mystery in the first and greatest commandment. Okay? 
when he says, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart. We know that. But there has been a lot of confusion about what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. Look, if you missed Elder Joe talking about that a few weeks ago on the Midweek Word, church, just so you know, we have a Midweek Word that's every single Wednesday night at 7 p.m. on Facebook and YouTube. Tune into that. I mean, I'm going to tell you, that word that, that Elder Joe gave a few weeks ago on that right there, loving your neighbor, it's just, it's amazing. You need, loving your neighbor as yourself, you need to go and listen to that. But look at this statement. In the same way we take care of ourselves and are concerned about our own interests, we should take care and have concern for the interest of others. I get this down in your spirit because really this kind of sums up what it means to love your neighbor. You're not just concerned with your own interest. You're concerned with the interest of others. You're all of a sudden it's not about just you. It's not your world. It's not your circle. It's now their circle overlapping with your circle. You have now come into theirs. And now you're concerned with them as well. So this statement says it clearly. Have concern for the interests of others. Then in verse 30, we begin the parable. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho... When you study, uh, you know, uh, the theology and you get in there and you look and uh, you can, in history, that was a dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho. So the listeners who are listening to this, this wasn't a shock that this guy got beaten up and robbed because this happened all the time to people on that road from Jerusalem to Jericho. So Jesus, you know, when he's talking and he's referencing things in the culture of that time, and he's, and he's talking to the people so that they can, they can have an inkling of what he's talking about. They can get a little bit of an idea. And for us, sometimes we've got to look and we've got to go and see what the culture was like at that time. The area, that, you know, and it gives us an idea. So this was a dangerous road to begin with. And so consider this picture when Jesus says a certain man. Now look, Jesus is talking to a bunch of Jews. He's talking to the Jewish people. So what we have to believe is that this certain man that he's talking about is a Jewish man. And most scholars will tell you that. So let's continue on. Verse 31, now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Now we've got two official representatives of the atonement as understood by the religious authorities of Jesus' day, and they find themselves unable and unwilling to see a wounded loser as having any claim on their attention or any relevance to their work. In other words, these two religious elites, they have a circle. Let's just pretend, you know, I got a little circle here. All right? And they see this man beaten down on the road. They went on the other side because they couldn't dare have their circle overlap on somebody else's circle that was like that. A guy like that? Oh, no, no, no. No, 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 no. Can't do that. Wouldn't be prudent. Okay? My circle will not overlap that circle. Forget it. And that's what these two religious elites they went on, they got their vocational ducks in a row, and they see no point in allowing their lives or their spiritual, moral, or physical plans to be ruined by some outcast. Now we keep reading, verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three, Jesus says, do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? 
And the lawyer said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Now, this is just amazing. It, it is amen. You know, I, I mean, the moment you read that right there, you just go, amen. And the first thing, look at this thing. This is not my notes, but the first thing I thought when I read what the Samaritan did, and look, I've known this story since I was little. Look, I went to Sunday school every day. You know, in the Sunday school, there was one Sunday uh, church we went to, and the teacher, just for showing up, was giving out Susan B. Anthony coins, okay? One, one of those for each Sunday for, these, for this six-week thing or so many weeks thing. I don't remember how many weeks it was because we were doing this certain lesson thing. And I remember one Sunday morning on one of those, I woke up and I was sick, man. I wasn't feeling good. And I immediately, I mean, I threw up, right? And my mom was like, okay, well, I guess I'll have to stay home. I was like, uh-uh. And you know what I was thinking? I want that Susan B. Anthony coin. Because I already had all, I wanted the perfect attendance during that time. And I was like, just pray, I'll be fine. Now look, my motive wasn't about Jesus, the scripture, this and that. I'm a kid, and what I had on my mind was that Susan B. Anthony coin. I wanted that coin. But hey, I had faith to believe God was going to heal me, hallelujah, because he wanted me to have that Susan B. Anthony coin. So my parents prayed, and I got up. I'm good. Let's go. And I went to church, and I got that Susan B. Anthony coin. But I heard every story in Sunday school. I heard them all. I heard this story. But see, I read it just this past week, and something hit me that's never hit me before. And it just spoke to me. And I'm looking at what this Samaritan did, and I had to ask myself a question. Would I do that? Now, maybe that didn't hit you just now. Maybe it did. But boy, it hit me. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Would I do that? In verse 33, I like when Jesus says, but. So here's this man. He's all beat up. And Jesus says, but. See, when you're all beat up and you feel like an outcast and you're all in a bad place, just say but. But it's not just but, it's but Jesus. When you have that kind of feeling, you can call out to him. Jesus said, but. Now look, the Samaritans were not accepted by the Jewish people. Here's something that you've got to understand. And the reason why I'm sitting there going, would I do that? Okay. The Samaritans were not accepted by the Jewish people. They were outsiders to them. So we've got an outsider ministering to another outsider. And these two outsiders just happen to hate each other. And when I say hate, I mean hate. When you go look up and you study back then what was going on between these two people, they hated each other. The Jewish people, look, if you were a Gentile, Samaritan, you were this, that, it didn't matter. Babylonian, you're scum. You're a Roman. You're, 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 you're awful. I mean, that's how the Jewish people were. And the Samaritans were just as bad towards the Jewish people. They had disagreements like crazy. They did not like each other. They weren't accepted a loser, though, is coming and ministering to another loser. I want you to get a hold of this because the people who are listening that Jesus is talking to, they're going, this Samaritan, oh, he's a loser. Okay, what's, oh my gosh, no way. He touched, oh, he went and touched him? Oh my goodness. Okay, you know, he, totally upset. Look, I, I'm just trying to get, to, I'm hoping I'm just, you know, <laughs> I'm hoping that you're hearing me today. I really do. Because these people are just, they're listening to Jesus. And they're like, this guy's awful. I, we can't, the Samaritans would never do that. We don't like them. Uh-uh. And then this guy's all beat up and he's all this. No way. I wouldn't touch him. There's no way we could do that. 
And that's how, that's how they were. So you have to understand the culture at the time. And remember, Jesus has been emphasizing losing over winning. The last will be the first. We have to die to ourselves, church, so that we can win through Christ. You know, generally speaking, Jews and Samaritans despised each other both racially and religiously. I mean, it was both. They had cultural differences. They had, uh, and, and, and there was that racial, prejudicial, you know, animosity towards one another. But then they had these religious differences that, boy, they hated that. And I, we don't have time to get into all those, but you can look that up. It's, it's kind of interesting how the Samaritans believed in the, in, in the word up until Joshua. And then after that, they kind of cut it off and they do something a little squirrely and this and that. Yeah, they believe in Elohim, but, you know, it's just it's different for them. OK, and so both of them. They're at odds. There's no way we're handshaking. But despite all of this, the scripture says the Samaritan had compassion. Let's look at that verse one more time. If I can find it, I will find it in Jesus' name. In verse 33, a certain Samaritan as he journeyed, and when he saw him, it's, it, it, immediately when he saw him, he had compassion. Mm. This word compassion, and we talked about it for, uh, before, but the Greek word, it comes from another Greek word, which means the bowels. So it means the seed of compassion. Remember that? We talked about that just, just last week. But I want to emphasize this because it's only God-given, Holy Spirit-promoted compassion. Look, everybody has a little twinge of compassion when they see somebody, just naturally speaking. But no, we're talking about from the very fiber of his being. It just leaped out from him. It was compassion. It was from the seat of his bowels. It was within him, everything that he was. At that moment, everything else didn't matter. His plans didn't matter. What he had going on, where he was traveling to, nothing mattered but that man laying down there beaten and bruised. The only thing that mattered was him to this Samaritan. That's what's so amazing. Mm. Everyone has emotions. Everyone feels a bit, if you will, of compassion. But not everyone has it screaming out from their insides, compelling them to do something most won't. Church, not everybody's got it. You have to submit to the Spirit to get that. You have to pray in the Spirit to get that. You have to be on your knees to get that kind of compassion to the level that this Samaritan did. Now look, the priest and the Levite, they had all kinds of excuses as to why they couldn't, you know, help him. This road is too dangerous for me to stop and help this man. He might be a decoy for an ambush. Maybe there's somebody else and we might get it. I've got to get to the temple and perform my service to the Lord. I've got to get home and see my family. Someone really should go and help that man. How many have ever looked at somebody else and said, oh, somebody should do that? Mm. If I'm going to serve at the temple, I can't get my clothes dirty and bloody or anything like that. I don't know how to tend to him. I don't know first aid. It's a hopeless case. He's going to die anyways. I'm only one person. The job's just too big for me. I'll pray for him. I like that one. How many's been in there? Uh, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. He brought it on himself. He never should have been alone on a dangerous road. He never asked for help, so I don't need to stop. You know, just because someone doesn't ask for help doesn't mean that they don't need help. Just because they don't ask doesn't mean they don't need it. We've got to be in the spirit. We've got to be checking on our neighbors. In the end, all of these, they're just excuses, regardless of how good one might sound. I don't think any of those sounded good, but I mean, many times we come up with excuses and we have these excuses and we know what excuses are like. We don't need to talk about that. But see, there's some similarities between the Samaritan and Jesus. The priest and the Levite, all they had was excuses. 
But the Samaritan, oh no, he didn't have an excuse. What he had was compassion. And he was like Jesus in many ways. The Samaritan was an outsider despised by many. The scripture says that Jesus was despised and rejected of men. The Samaritan came after others failed to meet the need. Jesus does that as well. The Samaritan came before it was too late. How many are so glad that Jesus showed up before it was too late for you? Amen. The Samaritan came with everything necessary. He had the horse and put him on the horse. He had the money. He had the means to get him to where he needed to go to help him. Jesus has everything you need. He says that he'll supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. He came right, the Samaritan came right to the afflicted man. He gave tender care. He provided for future needs. He said, hey, for however long he needs to stay, I'll pay it. Jesus paid it all for you and me. He paid everything for our future. He laid it down so that we could do the same for others. And we could sacrifice our time our talent, and our treasure, all three. And when we sacrifice all three of those to the Lord, we are blessed in ways that we, can, we, we, we can't even comprehend. In verse 36, I want to read this again. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And, and the lawyer said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Jesus completely shifted the ground of the question. And by this reply said in effect that the question as to who is a neighbor was not as important as the question to whom he was a neighbor. So, who are you a neighbor to? That's the question. It's not about who's my neighbor. No, it's about who are you being a neighbor to. Whose circle are you going to go and put your circle right in theirs? Who are you going to overlap with? The lawyer's response, we see that he could no longer justify himself. He had to make a change based on what he had just heard from Jesus. Church, we have to make a change based on what we just read. Jesus doesn't ask us, he commands us and says, go and do likewise. We're to go and do what the Samaritan did. Now, understand, this doesn't mean, you know, look, I'm to love my neighbor. Even my neighbor is the one who might others, uh, who might consider me an enemy or whatever, who met whatever. It doesn't matter. Everyone's my neighbor, whether they like me or not, or whether I like them or not. My neighbor is the one with a need right in front of me. That's my neighbor. But it doesn't mean that we run after every need that might present itself. I want to look. The Samaritan didn't establish a hospital for all the unfortunate travelers in the area. Okay. He took care of that need right there. We have to be led by the spirit and do what the spirit is saying. It does mean. And this story, if, what, what this parable means is that we or to have concern for the ones that are plainly set before us in both social and spiritual needs. And we meet those as best that we can. Alexander McLaren said this, The world would be a changed place if every Christian attended to the sorrows that are plain before him. What is plain set before you? And you know what? Maybe there's been some things here. You, you know, you're thinking about some people right now. Just, you know what? Let that go. Let the past go. Any mistakes, put all that behind. You put all of that in the rearview mirror. And as you drive along in the kingdom of God, that stuff will just get so small, you won't be condemned by it anymore. What you do is you look at the needs that are plainly set before you moving forward, saying to the Lord, Lord, I'm going to be obedient to your voice. I'm going to be obedient and reach and touch that one that's plainly set before us. Last thoughts. 
as I'm ending here, the Samaritan went the extra mile. This man went above and beyond. Church, he did a lot for this guy. Most people would have just dropped him at the hospital and left or whatever, you know. He didn't just get him off the road and dump him on somebody else. No, he took care of him himself. He didn't dump him on the pastor. Let me just say that one more time. He didn't dump him on the pastor. You know. Hey, look, it's happened. I'll preach the message and be like, we got to reach and we got to touch these people. And next thing you know, hey, Pastor TJ, I just met this guy. Could you come? And do you are the minister. Just as much as I, it does, the Samaritan didn't go, oh, you know, wait, I, I don't know if I got all the qualifications. Let me go find somebody. And no, he just did it. He just did it. It's not, oh, let me get somebody to help me help that person. Help them. Help them. Amen. The second thing is grow beyond prejudices and be kind to everyone. I mean, these two, this man, the Samaritan, that was a Jewish man laying there. He's supposed to hate him, but he laid that down. It's like, no. In our society right now, in our culture right now, this is more important and it's prevalent everywhere we see. We need to lay down our prejudices. Amen. The last thing is be a doer, not just a talker. Here's this man, the Samaritan. He was a doer. He wasn't just talking a good talk like the religious elite before him that came by. No, he was a doer. He was a doer of the word. Let's all stand. So this morning we need to respond. And you know, this one right here was not like some of the other parables we've been going over and, and there's some sort of like revelation. It's like, oh, I never saw that before per se. Yes, this one was simplistic. The message is simple. The message is very simple. That we are to go and do likewise. And we're to be a neighbor to those that are plainly set before us, that are right there. So we have to respond today, and we need to talk to the Lord, each individual. And what you say to the Lord is different than what I'm saying to the Lord. You know why? Because I know me. I know what I need to work on. I know the change that I need to make in myself. And that I need to submit to the Lord to have that change in me so that I can do what that Samaritan did. I don't know exactly where you're at. So you have to make the change that you know you need to make. That the Spirit is saying to you right now. And so as we pray, I'm going to pray. But listen to what the Lord is specifically saying to you. Not what I'm saying in the words that I'm saying. What is the Spirit saying to you so that you can be like this Samaritan man? Let's pray. Father, this morning, right now, we submit ourselves to you. We put ourselves on the altar now and we die to ourselves. And Lord, we say not our will, but your will be done through us on this earth as it is in heaven. Lord, as you gave us this parable, this example of the Good Samaritan, may we take this to heart and go and do likewise. Make that change in me, Father God. Just say that to the Lord. Make that change in me. And you know what that change is. Make that change in me, Lord. May I crucify myself. May I be willing to have my schedule interrupted. May I be willing to part with that $20 in my pocket or even that $100 in my account. Father, may I be willing to give of my time, my talent, and my treasure to help those around me in need. 
in Jesus' name. And right now we come against every hindrance. We command it to go right now in Jesus' name. We say the enemy cannot stop us. We come against all the lies and we break them now that would say, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. We just break that right now in Jesus' name. And I say under the anointing of the Lord, you can do it. You can do it in Jesus' name. God has anointed you to do it. He's put you on the earth here to advance in the kingdom in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Shikatarariya Sunday. Hallelujah in Jesus' name. Lord, we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor. Hallelujah in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Now before you turn me off and you're listening to me online, and just for everyone here, July 11, we're going back to Garfield Sunday mornings, okay? So we'll, every Sunday morning we will be back at Garfield beginning July 11. So between now and then, be sure and listen online, uh, YouTube and Facebook. Guys, when you listen on YouTube, put a like on that video. As soon as you get out there, just put a like and then get into the chat, you know. Um, if you're on your mobile phone, you have to close the chat temporarily, hit like, and then you can pull the, the chat back up. So like those videos. What that does, it gives us more exposure. Hey, we want the word to go out everywhere, right? Amen. Amen. So... Be sure and hit a like on that video when you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook. You know, comment down below. We love that. Uh, also, Midweek Word, this Wednesday night, 7 p.m., tune in. You don't want to miss these. These are really good. And if you have any prayer requests, you can send them into this email address right here, prayer at churchpluggedin.com. Now, this morning, for all of those that are here sitting before me, if you have any prayer needs that you need agreement and prayer of, Dad and Brother Landy is going to come forward here at this time, and they can pray with you on those needs. Be sure and take advantage of that. You can share with them. They can pray that prayer of faith and agreement with you. Uh, if not, God bless, and be sure and tune in on Wednesday. Amen.